Recording started. Good morning, everyone. So how's your day start? Good morning. Good morning. So Sid, how was your day today? Am I it was good. It went well. Thank you for asking. That's nice. That's nice. OK. OK. So today we are going to study, we are going to continue in studying the Book of Kings. As we know, uh, the first and second Kings are one single book called as Kings in the Hebrew Bible. Good morning, Divya. OK, so even before we could start, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Reuben. Reuben, can you lead us in prayer? Okay. Zelitoli, can you lead us in prayer, please? Father God, I come before your presence in the name of Jesus. I thank you so much for this session as we're going to study your word. I pray that Holy Spirit will guide us, lead us, bless our name as she teaches the word of God and also help us to be receptive to your word, Lord. Teach us, guide us throughout this session in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. I'll just present the presentation. Okay. Today, we are going to study about the different kings in Israel. And along with that, we will also study about Elijah and Elisha, the two powerful prophets who operated in the power of God. So uh, just uh, uh, to recap on what we covered is, uh, uh, you know, this the author of this book, uh, you know, the Jewish scholars believe that Jeremiah would be the author of this book. And they suggest that most of the events of these books were recorded in the final year of the southern kingdom from uh, 630 uh, BC to 600 BC. And the book of the first and second kings or the kings, although they were two separate books in our Bible, they are originally written as one single book and it is a unified story that continues from uh, the book of Samuel that came before this. Uh, so we see in the book of Samuel how uh, David had uh, unified the tribe of Israel into the kingdom of God and promised that uh, from this line uh, would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. And also we see uh, the um, book of uh, Kings tells us the story of the long line of kings that came after David and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they uh, they they run the nation of Israel into, uh, you know, into grounds. So yesterday we studied uh, on the Solomon's reign, on the life of Solomon and his reign and the uh, construction of the temple, which became an uh, wonder in the ancient, one of the wonders in the ancient times. And today, along with the other kings, we will be studying on on uh, the two major prophets, that is Elijah and Elisha, we will see how they. Uh, uh, we will see how uh, Jerusalem's destruction and Israel exile to Babylon, along with them. So in the book of Second Kings, we see that the uh, story, uh, you know, uh, went up to a tragedy uh, to know like how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, uh, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets. But, you know, helplessly, they cannot avoid the consequence of Israel's sin. And the book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging of David to uh, the son, uh, his son Saul 
Solomon. And we see in chapter 2 how David's final words to Solomon were very similar to those of Moses uh, when he handed over to Joshua. And we also see Samuel when in his farewell, how he uh, guided the people of Israel before he could pass. The same way we see David uh, sharing some of his wisdom to Sam, uh, Solomon that he may take it up. So Solomon's uh, life started with the brightest moments. Uh, you know, he had peace all around and he received the wisdom of God, uh, which helped him to lead people and the other nations in peace. And he also... Um, and he also uh, built the temple for God. It was one of the uh, a big and a good project for him that he completed it well. Uh, though Solomon really, uh, realized uh, the sin later part uh, because of his uh, foreign wives and worshipping uh, and building altar for the pagan gods and worshipping them. Uh, he went astray from God which uh, made God to get ang uh, become uh, uh, furious on him. But then the later part of the book with all his wisdom yes we read in ecclesiastes which he says everything is vanity but then uh, the bible has not recorded that uh, solomon repented before his death and um, and we see the effect of this in his son who took over after solomon was Rehobo rehoboam i think just like his father in a very and it is a very story of what he did, the story of his greed and lust for his power. Uh, he tries to increase the taxes to his uh, uh, slave labor. In fact, they came with the leadership of Jeroboam. Uh, those, uh, these are the people from the northern tribe of Israel. They, uh, they came to him asking that uh, he may reduce the tax and be in favor. But then uh, Rehoboam did consult the elders who sat in uh, uh, front of him from his father Solomon's time. They advised him. You know, they, the elders did advise Rehoboam to, you know, reduce the tax, be in favor to them so that they will be loyal to you. But then he refuses to take their advice and he chooses to take the advice of his uh, uh, the uh, of his age group youth and you know he makes a very bad decision by increasing the wages to these slave trade uh, slave uh, people say slave labor uh, and uh, you know, uh, this makes Jeroboam, who was the leader of this tribe in the northern tribe, rebel against Rehoboam. And, uh, you know, uh, they fight and the tribe have been uh, uh, split into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And we see uh, the split in the kingdom and the northern kingdom, uh, uh, Samaria is the capital and uh, in the southern kingdom, Judah was the capital. And um, eventually Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with the Solomon's temple in the south. So what he does is he builds a temple in the northern kingdom and he puts a golden calf in each to represent the God of Israel. You know, uh, the connection goes to uh, the uh, book of Exodus in chapter 2. We see that how the people of Israel formed a golden calf. Um, so it's all quite clear from this point onwards. The story goes back and forth from northern kingdom Kingdom to the southern kingdom and you know they both are uh, uh, competing unnecessarily with each other and we see um, the kingdoms gradually fall and each one uh, had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom uh, each of them had 20 successful kings and uh, and uh, uh, we see uh, the author of this book says that each king evaluates their reign by a, a few criteria that they worship the God of Israel alone. They didn't have that and they did uh, or they didn't promote the uh, they also. Uh, they promoted the worship of the other gods because uh, they were pagan culture already uh, among them and they started promoting and worshipping the other gods and uh, and we see um, there is uh, idolatry among the people and 
they remained unfaithful to God or to the covenant, uh, uh, you know, the uh, covenant God was not kept among the people of Israel. And we see a lot of corrupt and injustice happening among them. And maybe this, uh, not maybe, this was the reason the downfall of Israel and uh, and. We see in the southern kingdom, there were few good kings, the uh, few good kings uh, who followed God, the one true God. And in the northern kingdom, we do not find any king among the 20. None followed the true God of Israel. But in the southern kingdom, we had about few kings, maybe uh, eight out of 20 were good who followed the God of Israel. So in the Bible, uh, we see that the prophets were uh, not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of God of Israel and they played the role of uh, covenant overseer, which means they called out the idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. And they were constantly reminding uh, Israel of their calling to be the light to the nation, that they should obey the commands of God. They should keep up the Torah. And so the prophets challenged the king and the people of Israel to repent and follow their God constantly. Uh, so that's how we see the role of uh, Elijah and Elisha here. So that God raises up prophets like Elijah and Elisha and they also add a center of prophets uh, I mean the school of prophets later we see that in this book which is very prominent and Elijah being a wild man of a prophet uh, living out in the desert and his uh, opponent was uh, the northern King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god, god Baal, over Israel. So, there's a famous story of Elijah challenging 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was a real god. So, what happens here is they build up a big altar and they pray to their god, but but you know. Uh, 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 but the God does not show up. Again, we see that in First Kings chapter 18. 18. Again, uh, at um, Elijah at Mount Carmel victory. Okay, uh, so again, uh, Elijah mocks at them. He, he says, uh, pro uh, "He says uh, the prophets of Baal. Maybe your God is not uh, able to hear. So shout out, shout loud." He provokes them, and they do it. They do it, but then. Nothing happens. Uh, nothing happens. So Elijah said to all the people, come near to me in verse 30. First Kings chapter 18, verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar. Okay, repaired the altar uh, that was broken. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of Israel. And and uh, and uh, the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. And when the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold the two sheaves of, of the seed. So he put the sacrifice of the bulls. Uh, and what he did is after that, he put water on the altar to make it more difficult. Whereas when the uh, when uh, when the prophets of Baal sacrificed, they didn't put any water. But then they called up. They got didn't answer. Uh, finally, it was late in the evening. They gave up. When they gave up, Elijah started to repair the altar. He put the sacrifice uh, on the altar. And then what he does is he 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 pours water on the sacrifice. He pours water on the sacrifice and on the wood so that, uh, you know, uh, the fire does not catch easily. But then this is just to make the people understand around him that truly it is the God of uh, the God of Israel is the true God. So what happens? We see in verse 37, hear me, O Lord, Elijah prays, hear me, uh, Elijah prays from 36 onwards, you see, and it came to pass at the time of offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, 
let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and that I have done all these things as your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. When those people screamed and shouted, their God did not answer. But here, when Elijah just did a simple prayer, he didn't scream, he didn't shout. He just did a simple prayer. And the Lord answered his prayer. The fire came and consumed complete sacrifice along with the water. And the people who were around witnessed the true living God. Even today, my friends, we may be in such situation. When we pray, let's pray in faith. And our God is a God who listens to every word of our prayer. Every word of our prayer. He listens. There were many miracles listed about Elijah doing every time. We also see in chapter 19 what happens. In chapter 19, we see, um, you know, uh, how uh, Ahab told, uh, because, uh, okay, uh, after uh, after the consuming the sacrifice, so Elijah uh, says in verse 40, we see that he seizes the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them all. When he executed them all, Ahab the king, You know, uh, he goes and tells the queen Jezebel all that what happened on Mount or uh, on Mount Carmel, and he goes and tells him. And now uh, Jezebel says, Jezebel says that uh, this time tomorrow Elijah will be dead. She sends a messenger to tell uh, to, to, to 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 tell Elijah that this time tomorrow you will be dead. And uh, when he himself went, uh, then the minute Elijah heard, the minute he heard, verse 3, chapter 19, verse 3 we see, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. I see some comments coming. Ma'am, would you mind checking the waiting room, please? Yes, please. Someone waiting. I don't see anyone waiting, Sid. I don't see anyone waiting. Okay. Okay, if anyone is waiting, sit, please let me know. Okay. Okay, we'll continue with the class. So we see, uh, we are in chapter 19, verse 3. So we see that Elijah was so powerful. He just defeated 450 prophets of Baal. He killed them. And suddenly, the minute he heard a decree from uh, uh, Queen Jezebel that you will be killed, he's so fearful, you know, he starts running for his life. And uh, he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey. I think somebody joined now. Okay, good. Okay, so we'll continue. 
So he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. We are on verse 4. So he sat under a broom tree and see what he did. And he prayed, saying what? That he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. What happened to this man? Was just so powerful. He, he he saw so many miracles before this. He uh, you know he saw the Lord uh, fed him through ravens. You know through ravens God fed him, and uh, when he was full of faith, you know uh, Elijah was full of faith, and you know uh, uh, supernaturally God fed him through the raven every day. And then uh, uh, Lord sent, uh, when the brook got dried, Lord sent Elijah to a widow in Zarephah. And she sustained him. There was a miracle of the flour and oil never went dry in her house and she could feed prophet Elijah till the famine sustains. You know, he had, uh, he had seen the power of God when he was so much of faith. Now he's in depression. He's running for his life. And now he's giving up. He could not run anymore in his life. So he prays, sitting under a broom tree, he's praying, Lord, that I might die. Take me away. But what did Lord do? What did Lord do? See, when he, was, when he had faith, God miraculously fed him. We may think when we are depressed, God may not hear our prayer. We should have faith more for God to answer our prayer. But then what happened to Elijah? In this situation, you see what happens. Verse 5, then, then he lay and slept under a broom tree with all his weakness, no more strength in his body. He just fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and, and there by his head was a cake baked on coal and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Now what happened? When he had faith, God fed him through the ravens and sustained him through the widow. But now, when he's depressed and lonely, running after running for his life, and finally he, he gave up, we see God sent his angel, and God fed him with his food. He himself fed him. He himself fed him. During our difficult times, we see the presence of God much greater than the good times. God himself will be with us. The God who was with Elijah. God who never gave up his soul to the queen of Jezebel to kill him. He was a man of God. God honored him. God fed him. God sustained him. Again, we see in verse 7, again, the angel of the Lord came back second time, touched him and said him, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate and drank, and he went into strength for next 40 days and 40 nights. He could sustain himself with that food. And he went to Horeb, the mountain of God. And again, he started to grow in strength, grow in faith, grow in God. So if we are in the Lord, do not have to imagine that, you know, we will be in the same flight. All times will be good times. No, there will be ups and downs in our life. So what is important is, how are we seeking God? When we seek Him, with all our heart, he will answer us. One thing we need to remember is during a difficult season in our life, God himself will be with us much more than what he was in the other good times with us. 
he himself will sustain us he himself will provide us he himself will strengthen us the god who strengthened elijah that he could go ahead for next 40 days the god himself will be with us and sustain us and after that we see god gives him an assignment and he tells him down the verse we go to verse 15 and the lord said to him go return on your way to the wilderness and damascus and when you arrive anoint Hazel as king over Syria and anoint Jehu the son of Nimish as king over Israel and Elisha the son of Safat of Abel Meholoth you shall anoint him as a prophet in your place so God is raising leader after Elijah Elisha God is mindful of who will replace Elijah after he goes and also God raises Elisha and he gets he gets enough time to be trained with Elijah. And also God puts this desire in Elisha not to leave Elijah no matter where he goes. We see that Elisha goes, grows in strength from strength. And later we also see, uh, you know, uh, King Hayab uses his royal power and he murders the Israelite farmer and then steals his family's vineyard. And um, Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. And Elijah called down. Uh, you know, and again, when uh, there's uh, there's ups and downs, there was another situation where uh, 50 men come from King Ahaziah against Elijah. And Elijah called down the fire from heaven to slay these two groups of 50 men and the other place, 51 men. And consume them. And the third group of men was led by a commander who pleads for mercy with Elijah and he escapes. And later part we see how Elijah, uh, Elisha follows Elijah closely and it's time for Elijah to move. And uh, we see how Elijah and Elisha cross the river Jordan. Elisha, uh, uh, we see Elijah, just give me a minute, I'll just play that picture. So Elijah just puts his mantle onto the river Jordan and the river Jordan parts. What uh, does this remind of any event before? The Red Sea Party. Okay. Even uh, does it remind us when uh, Joshua was leading the Israelites, they had to cross the river Jordan and come to a place called Gilgal. Do you all remember? Yes. Yes, ma'am, yes. We saw uh, Joshua asking the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant and step into the river. The minute the priest leg steps into the river, the river parts. So what was it? The presence of God in the Ark was flowing on the one who carried the Ark. The minute they stepped, the water parted. The same way, the minute Elijah puts his mantle onto the river, the, uh, the river parted. So there was a presence of God in that mantle. So when uh, when he parted the river, when he parted the river, he crosses, and then we see uh, Elijah been Elijah been uh, uh, he was about to take away in the whirlwind then uh, Elisha knowing because even as a prophet knowing that Eli it's time for Elijah to go. So Elijah, Elisha asks Elijah to bless him with a double portion of the anointing and uh, Elijah says if you see me taken off uh, it will be and you know uh, as uh, Elijah was taken off 
he throws the mantle on uh, Elisha and the mantle falls on him. He takes that mantle and he comes back. And Elisha saw Elijah being taken up uh, with, in fire and like a vril wind with two horses. And he sees this scene. This is an imaginary scene which has been uh, depicted by some artists. So I thought I can put this. And we see the river Jordan there. <clears throat> the mantle falls. And now Elisha takes that mantle and he gets back. When he's getting back again, he puts that mantle onto the river and again the river parts for Elisha to cross. So this shows that um, Elisha carried the power what Elijah had as it started working with him. So uh, Eli Elisha used this mantle to uh, uh, bring in many miracles. Uh, bring in many miracles and uh, one such was we will turn to second kings chapter chapter 4 verse uh, 38 now uh, elisha is uh, taking over the prophetic school and he's been training all the prophets and one such day it happened like during the time of uh, uh, famine we are in verse 38 and elisha returned to gilgal now what is gilgal Gilgal was the first place when Joshua led all the 12 tribes, the children of Israel, they crossed the river Jordan. They rested in that place. This was the place called Gilgal. Gilgal was a place of blessing. It was a place where uh, the, the children of Israel rested. It is a place where uh, the uh, the children during the 40 years, they didn't, uh, the first ma uh, the male child did not uh, undergo the circumcision. But at the place of Gilgal, when they rest, Joshua, uh, God instructed Joshua uh, for the circumcision to be done and all the male child were circumcised and we see this was the place where um, God instructed Joshua to carry the 12 uh, tribes to carry each stone from the river of Jordan and they placed these 12 stones as a uh, as a memorial in the place of Gilgal and they recollected that and uh, Gilgal was a place where uh, the uh, rolling of the shame the shame was rolled off from them that they were no more slaves but they were children and God has promised them with a promised land they will have a land and then now back to this verse 38 we see Elisha returned to Gilgal and there was a famine in the land. Now there's a famine. Now the sons of the prophet were sitting before Elisha and he said to his servant, put on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophet. So he's instructing them to put on a large pot and make stew. Now the stew has been prepared. Now, what happens? The next verse we see in verse 39. One person goes out into the field. Now, why did he go? He was not instructed. He himself thinks, okay, the herbs or the spices are not enough. Let me go do something extra. Now, we need to believe on the prophet. We need to believe what he's been preparing. In the same way, we need to believe on the finished work of the cross of Jesus. We should not do something extra, add something to what Jesus has already done and completed on the cross. So this person, he goes uh, <clears throat> to the field and um, he gathers some herb. He does not even know what it is. He, he, he just felt, okay, this is something very, looks very good. So let me take it. This is what happened in, even in the Garden of Eden. When God instructed to have uh, <clears throat> the fruit from the good tree, but then something that was attractive, which God did not instruct and instructed them not to touch it, but something that was attracting lust of the eyes, led them to sin. The same way here, this person felt this this wedge or this herb may be good. So he, he takes a lap full of wild guards and came and slices them and he puts it into the pot and uh, they did not and he did not even know what they were. 
And what happened in verse 40, and they served the stew, served it to all men to eat. And now what happened? They were eating the stew. And suddenly the prophets cried out saying, man of God, there is death in the pot. Now the food is prepared to nourish the body, to give life to the body and not bring death. Now what happened? This is bringing death and they could not eat it. So what we usually do, if something bad has fallen in a food, we tend to take it and throw away and keep up the other food. But then it's a stew, it has been boiled, it's been spread over. So what Elisha does, we see the next verse. So Elisha says, then bring some flour and he puts it into the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Now what happened? Something that was harmful, something that if they eat, they would die. But Elisha added flour to it. And he gave the same stew for everyone to eat. And now it was edible. Now this stew was, uh, you know, was able to nourish the body when they eat. It brought life. When we believe on the finished work of cross, with all our heart, with all our mind and soul, with complete faith, you see it brings blessing. It nourishes us. It brings life into our dead birth situation. So we need to believe on the finished work of cross and we should not do anything extra. Elisha the prophet went on to do many miracles like this. We will see the list of miracles of Elisha and Elijah. Elijah did eight miracles. We see how the even shut causing the drought and um, you know multiply the flour and oil for a widow, raised the widow's son from dead, defeated the prophets of Baal with fire from heaven, and brought rain uh, to end and the drought, destroyed all 51 soldiers with fire and lightning. And again, he destroyed another set of 51 soldiers with fire and lightning. And he parted the water of Jordan before he was taken off. And with his uh, blessing, with the double portion anointing, Elisha does 16 miracles that has been recorded. Okay, one thing we need to know, all that has been recorded is may not have, uh, that is not the limit that they would have done. They would have done many, but this is what has been recorded. Elijah would have done many miracles in his lifetime, but then eight was recorded. And the author was mindful of the double the portion. So though Elisha, Elijah did eight miracles and uh, which has been recorded and for Elisha they have recorded 16 miracles just double than that but maybe both of them did much more and uh, we see uh, the first miracle which Elisha did after passing of Elijah was parted the water of Jordan river and he crossed over and then he purified the water then uh, sent bear to ravage his attackers, caused the flood to save Israel, to foil the Moabites. You know, so many such miracles that he did, we see in Second Kings. Multiplied the loaves and he healed uh, Naaman. We see in chapter 5, uh, very soon after this, we see healing of Naaman, a uh, commander who was healed. A simple instruction Elijah, Elisha gives him. He didn't even visit Naaman face to face. He just sends a messenger to Naaman saying that, Naaman, go dip yourself in the river of Jordan seven times and the lepr you will be healed from this leprosy. Though Naaman initially was... Uh, was uh, was furious on him, but then uh, uh, his servants encouraged Naaman to just follow what the prophet says. And when he obeyed, when he humbled himself and he obeyed, we see the healing come to pass. Same way, sometimes God speaks to us in very uh, small things, small like simple things he asks us to do. But then when we do that, we see greater things happen. We see healing, we see blessing. So what is important Important is the obedience to God, obedience to his word. We see the blessing of God flow into us and we see the other miracles happen after that.
Ja. So, um, we see later part, uh, El Elisha falls sick and he passes away. Many miracles he does and he, pa uh, he passes away. And after that, both the prophets were clearly remarkable men. And they played the same role, confronting Israel's king for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from uh, the idol worship and you know uh, the apostasy but in the next section we see the northern kingdom as rocked by a blood revolution and started by a new king named Jehu who destroys Ahab's family and although Jehu was at first commissioned by God his violence just gets out of control and he creates the spiral of the political assassination and rebels from, uh, you know, rebels from which Israel can never be recovered. And then uh, we see many other kings reign. The final moment of this book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom uh, is here and we meet a very uh, heroic king like Ezekiah who trusts God uh, uh, when the armies of the Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem door uh, or Hosea who discovers his lost scroll of Torah in the temple. So he starts to read it and he convicts and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry in the Canaanites influence and from the land of Judah and it's just too far gone. Uh, but then the king, uh, uh, you know, uh, is there. And uh, in, in this season, uh, there's another king who raises Manasseh. And he turns to be the one of the wicked king. And he not only introduced worship again to the idols, now he turns the Jerusalem temple. He puts the idols in the Jerusalem temple and he institutes child sacrifice in the temple of God. And God sent prophets to say the time is up. Israel has reached the peak. And, um, you know, we see in the final chapter that uh, the, uh, the story unfolds like, you know, the Babylonian comes to capture the southern kingdom and the um, Uh, Babylon coming to invade the Jerusalem and destroy the temple and carry the people and the royal line of David off into the exile. And in the last chapter, we see, uh, 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 you know, uh, we may wonder, like, what is happening to the line of David now? But then God gives favor to this king in the Babylon and he, he releases the line of David, that is Jehokin, who was the descendant from David. Uh, uh, so uh, the Babylonian king finds favor. Uh, God gives favor uh, uh, to Jehoiakim in the Babylonian king's eye and he releases him in the prison and the king says Jehoiakim to sit and dine from his stable. So we see uh, the... Um, uh, we uh, we see God's mercy and favor uh, to David's line. It's so it's not much, but in the story we see the hope that God has not abandoned the line of David, but He is merciful and He is mindful of the promise that He made to Abraham. So while we saw that the southern kingdom were captured by the Babylon, the northern kingdom was also captured by the Assyrians, and they take the whole people into the idolatry and you know, uh, many other things happen there. But in the southern kingdom, they captured by the Babylonians. And uh, now the king of Babylon has favor on the uh, li uh, descendant of David, Jehoiakim, and he releases him from the prison and he allows him to dine in, dine with him in the uh, table. And the rest of uh, rest from there, we will we will study on it when we study the next book on the first chronicles. So this is where the story ends in the book of kings and hoping that uh, God will work through this people. We will see how God will work through this people and keep up the lineage of David. Uh, yeah. So we have seen the fall of the great kingdom established by God because of their disobedience and unfaithfulness. Few things that we can learn from these books are obedience to God will bring blessing to us. Obedience to God will bring 
blessing to us. And the second we see we are responsible for our own action. We are responsible because as the king, they knew what they have to do, but then they had to face the consequence of their actions. And um, we didn't go much in detail because of time. But then I would recommend each of us to please go through each and every chapter of first and second king so that we will understand what is the responsible, what was their own action, why uh, the kings of Israel had to face all this. And the third point we see is we should not regard anything more highly than God. God should be our uh, first priority. And if we give, uh, you know, the first place to anything else, that becomes the idolatry. That becomes the idol in front of God. That uh, becomes the uh, 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 objection to receive God's blessing. So at any point in our life, we need to give that first place, that first priority to God. So now I leave it open to the class. What was each of us learning? Please share your points, what you learned from these two books, from your understanding. Class, you can unmute and share your understanding, share what was your learning from these two books. Classes of perfect silence. Sid, share what was your learning. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Ma'am, from, <laughs> from the Book of Kings, my learning was like, even though, is ma'am, what we see in the Kings, like in, as in the Genesis, Israel, Adam did sin. God, God made them. God made them repented. They suffered, and then they went to they went to Egypt. Egypt also, when Moses was them, they they repented. They were told that this is not good. This is not good in Egypt. We were happy. We were getting this much of things here in Egypt. We are not getting these things in. Then Moses came. Then Joshua came. When Israel wanted a king, God gave them a king, Saul. They were not happy with the Saul. Then David came. <clears throat> David was a man with the God's own heart. So the entire the entire in entire reign, David was blessed. And when Solomon came, though Solomon was a God fearing man, still he was not a good example for the people of Israel. But on the time on the time period of the forty years, he was having as God has promised with the David. God kept peace on his lifetime. So in this area, what I, I love the most, like even though we are not as the people God wants, still God is going, God is a God who keeps his promise. Yes. De God promised to David that he will keep his, that God will keep his kingdom for a lifetime. From the, um, uh, Jesus came from his kingdom. So there are many examples like, after Solomon, his successors was also like not doing what was the God's will, but still God was keeping his kingdom till the time Jesus came and his kingdom was not taken apart. Yes. Even though it was divided, but the God's promise lasted till Jesus. This is what the best thing I liked. Yes. Yes. And, God is and, a promise keeper. Yeah. And when the Abhisalom, and I also like how God loved Solomon even though his the David and David and Bathsheba's first son how he was like dead because of the curse that Abraham or David made Uriah died but the thing is how God is keeping Solomon for the kingdom even David had a desire to build a temple for the God but David not was not able to still God kept that my son David has a heart to build a temple for me David cannot make it, but my sons, Solomon, can make it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. That was a good recap. Thank you. Okay.
So, Sid, can you please lead us in prayer as we end this class? Is there anyone else? Sorry, Sid. Is there anyone else who would like to add, share? Okay, Sid, can you close the class in prayer? Okay, ma'am. Father, we come to the throne of grace. We thank you for the, the yes. time you have given us. We thank you for the, all the learnings. Lord, as we see in the King's book, Lord, we have learned in chapter in King's book, Lord, whatever we have learned, whatever the failures the, the, the kings of Israel has done, Lord, that should not be repeated in our life, O oh Lord. Yes. Whatever the success they went through, whatever the blessing they went through, Lord, as we are the sons of Abraham, Lord, we are your kingdom, we are Lord, Lord we are your chosen generation, Lord, we want all the blessings should be added to our lives also. Whatever the things, whatever the blessings you have given to to them, O oh Lord, 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 it it should be added to our our accounts also, Lord. We thank you for the time you have given us. We thank you for the man. We thank you for this session, Lord, the opportunity you have given us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's class. Thank you and God bless. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. God bless.